Hey guys, what's going on? It's Ben here, and today I want to do a video which has really come to my attention recently because I've just been thinking about the standings and how teams are doing and kind of just reviewing what's what's gone on basically in the last couple of seasons in the NBA. And what I wanted to focus on in a video today was whether or not the Rockets trade for Chris Paul was worth it. Now, I know that probably a lot of people are going to have an, an initial gut reaction and say, yes, like um, he was definitely worth Patrick Beverly, Lou Williams, and Montrez Harrell. But today, I want to explore that more and uh, really get into whether it was truly worth it or not. And also along with that, some people may see the Clippers this year and have a gut reaction of, no, it wasn't worth it. All those guys are better than he is. Uh, but... Today I want to kind of look at that subject matter, uh, de not debate because I'm only the, the only one talking about it, but just kind of analyze whether it was really worth it for the Rockets. So to review, uh, I'll just be going through w everything that the trade entailed as far as players that were swapped, uh, how each team did last year, how each team is doing this year and basically why I think it was a good trade for each team and why I think it's been a bad trade for each team. Okay, so getting into it first off, let's just talk about uh, basically what uh, each team got. So if you if you aren't familiar with the trade, basically the it was a sign-in trade of, or not a sign-in trade, it was just a straight-up trade. CP3 had an opt-out clause in his contract, uh, a lot of people thought he was going to opt out during the summer of 2017. He decided to opt in, but then the Clippers traded him right away to the Rockets. And in return, the Clippers got some throw-in players, but essentially the three main players they received back were Lou Williams, who is a sixth man of the former sixth man of the year and really good gunner off the bench, uh, Patrick Beverly, who was like their defensive stopper point guard, and then a backup power forward in Montrez Harrell, uh, who really, really hadn't done much in the NBA whatsoever before he came over to the Clippers. Uh, he was just a backup. And uh, besides that, the Clippers also got like Sam Decker and then like two other guys who were pretty, pretty unnotable and then a future first round pick. Um, so really what I want to look at is how has each team really gotten better or worse from this trade? Uh, so let's look at the Rockets, how they got better first off, uh, which I think was mainly seen last year in the 2017-18 season. Now, okay, so he uh, CP3 played 58 games for the Rockets last year during the regular season. He averaged numbers basically in line with his whole career, uh, 18.5 points, and he averaged 8 assists, which is a little bit lower, but they also had James Harden handling the ball a lot, so that made sense. And then he also had about two steals a game. He shot 46% from the field, 38% from three. So pretty good numbers, pretty in line with how he always does. As we all know, the Rockets won 65 games. They were the one seed. They got to the Western Conference Finals, where until he got injured, they looked like they were going to win it because they were up 3-2 to two on Golden State. Uh, and then looking at his playoff stats from last year, which I think would be helpful in discerning his impact on the team last year in the playoffs he averaged 21 points a game along with six rebounds six assists two steals a game he shot 46 percent from the field uh 37 percent from three so pretty good numbers um his scoring was definitely up a bit compared to what it might be in the regular season normally and so yeah i think that last year for sure the rockets benefited from having chris paul uh, okay, so now to look at the Clippers, who who last year, I guess I would say, really didn't benefit from this trade. Um, last year, Lou Williams actually had the best year of his career, you'd say. He averaged 23 points a game, along with a, around three rebounds and five assists a game. He shot 44% from the field, 36% from three. Uh, so some pretty decent numbers. Didn't He got like one steal a game, uh, so pretty all right. He also... Uh, he played 79 games, so they got a lot of use out of him. Uh, last year, Patrick Beverly didn't really play all that much. He played 11 games, but in those 11 games, he averaged 12 points a game, 
rebounds, three assists, two steals a game. He shot 40% from the field and 40% from three. So the from the field, not so great. From three, pretty good, though. Uh, but only 11 games, so they didn't really get much out of Pat Beverly last year. And then last year, Montrez Harrell uh, had a, a better impact than I think some people would have expected. Still not a big impact, only playing 17 minutes a game last year. He averaged 11 points a game along with four rebounds, one assist, roughly one block a game. He did have a great shooting percentage, though, as he has always had. He shot 64% from the field, and he didn't really take any three-pointers, so that's irrelevant. But he had, he had a building season. He went from a decent backup to a guy that I think people would be comfortable with having as a spot starter in the NBA. Now, I feel like where this trade really switched was uh, during this last offseason, honestly. Chris Paul was a free agent, 33 years old, and he demanded a max contract. And the Rockets sort of felt obligated to give it to him because uh, they had taken him in this trade. They didn't want to lose him for nothing. They were, they basically just thought that, um, basically in calculating their team's success, they equated a lot more of their team's success to him than I think was really apparent, was really there. What I mean by that is, I think possibly the team had, had, uh, or the executives like Daryl Morey had possibly attributed a lot more of their team success to Chris Paul's presence, ra rather than things such as Eric Gordon and James Harden just getting more comfortable in the system, or James Harden actually committing to defense, things like this. Uh, they they really I think were in signing him to the max forty million dollars a year contract. They were saying. Chris Paul is the reason that we were successful last year, which, while while there's no way to say whether it was really true or false, I think what we're currently seeing in the current NBA season uh, is that that might not have been the truth because uh, they lost a lot of key rotation players, like no more uh, Luke Mbamute or Trevor Ariza, which I know everyone has been beating that point to death that those guys aren't there and that's why they're not successful. So I'm not going to go into a ton on that right now. But I do think that it is a factor that they essentially uh, had Chris Paul, Ariza, and Baamute as free agents and to replace those guys. And they also had uh, Ryan Anderson, who they traded to clear up some cap space. But So they essentially lost those three guys. And to replace them, uh, so that th to review, the three guys they lost are Anderson, Ariza, and Baamute. To replace them, they brought in Brandon Knight, Michael Carter-Williams, and Marquise Chris. Uh, Knight and Chris were through the trade for Ryan Anderson, and then um, Michael Carter-Williams was through free agency. They also brought in James Ennis, who is supposed to be like a replacement Ariza. Uh, he hasn't been great this year, uh, not averaging a ton of points or anything. But to review Chris Paul's stats really quick, this year he is averaging around 17 points and 8 rebounds a game. He's averaging 42% from the field, 35% from three. I think he's uh, averaging around one steal a game, if I'm correct. Uh, he's actually doing pretty well with steals. He's averaging over two steals a game. Uh, just to briefly review what James Ennis is averaging, just so you have a rough idea. So this year for James Ennis, he's actually doing uh, pretty well, I'd say. He's averaging 9 points a game on 50% shooting from the field, 38% from 3. That's about as good as you could ask from him. I think anything more is uh, expecting a bit too much. Uh, okay, so then last year to review for Houston, they had Trevor Ariza. Basically, in they have now James Ennis filling the role Trevor Ariza played. Ariza last year averaged 12 points a game, 41% shooting from the field, 37% from 3. Uh, so similar production, basically. I think the big difference is uh, Trevor Ariza is proving to be a pretty good defensive asset and probably a little bit better than James Ennis. Um, on, well, pretty much certainly a better defensive player than James Ennis. Uh, James Ennis is also considerably smaller. I think Ariza is around 6'8", 230. Uh, James Ennis, 6'7", 210. You might not think that that's a huge difference, but it is a bigger deal than people think. So from this perspective, I think that the the trade has gone gotten worse for the Rockets in that they felt sort of obligated to Chris Paul to pay him the money in the offseason. And by doing that, they really compromised a lot of the depth of their team. Uh, 
in that they couldn't re-sign Ariza or Baamute or another effective free agent. They basically had to settle for like uh, taking a flyer on James Ennis and uh, trying to resurrect the careers of guys like Brandon Knight and Michael Carter Williams when they could have just brought back a guy like uh, Luke and Baamute. And now for this season, for the Clippers, I'd say this is where it's really turned around in that they they don't have to feel the pressure of signing a, a guy like Chris Paul, who's 33 years old already, to a four-year max deal, which is what they would have had to do probably if he would have been still in Los Angeles and hadn't been traded. But now they get the opportunity to kind of restart, rebuild, uh, they are they aren't a bad team though they're rebuilding in the best way possible they're remaining competitive while rebuilding last year i think they won 42 games so they weren't in the playoff hunt but they were still uh, a team that you couldn't just roll over uh, and so since this chris paul trade they traded away blake griffin as many people know for tobias harris essentially and avery bradley they also let uh, DeAndre Jordan walk in free agency because they didn't want to have to pay him some sort of a really big long-term or max contract. So they essentially have a ton of cash now. Uh, they weren't forced into signing any long extensions to guys who were approaching 30 or 33 years old like Chris Paul. Uh, and what they got back was a cache of some really nice young players and then some other players such as Lou Williams or Patrick Beverly, who while they aren't young, uh, they're on really reasonable contracts for the production they're giving them. Uh, so I'll start with Lou Williams. He this year is averaging 18 points a game, and he is shooting 40% from the field, 34% from three, uh, pretty much in line with career statistics for him, uh, except points is higher and shots per game is higher than usual. He's averaging five assists a game, three rebounds, uh, about one steal a game. Pretty much what you want out of Lou Williams. He also re-signed a contract for $8 million a year, which is a lot more reasonable than what they would have had to give to uh, Chris Paul. Uh, but also, what can't go forgotten in this trade is that they got Patrick Beverly, who is easy to forget because he really didn't play at all last year. Uh, this year, he's been kind of starting, kind of coming off the bench more as of late, playing 24 minutes a game. He is shooting pretty poorly, only 36% from the field this year. He's averaging seven points a game, four rebounds, four assists, one steal a game, uh, 33% from three. So he hasn't been doing great on offense, but he is more primarily a defensive player. He's still a good player on defense. Uh, he's basically a good backup point guard for them right now behind Shea Gilgis Alexander, who is proving to be a very good rookie. Uh, the guy that I really want to focus on is the guy who was seen as a throw-in originally for this trade, but it's blossoming in, into a really solid starter in the NBA, a guy that I am a really big fan of, and that is Montrez Harrell. Uh, this year, he actually still comes off the bench, but he's averaging 26 minutes a game, so he's getting a lot more playing time than he has previously in his career. He is shooting 65% from the field. Uh, He's averaging 16 points a night along with uh, seven rebounds and one and a half assists and one steal and almost two blocks a game, which is really good for him. Nobody expected this. Uh, he also isn't taking a ton of shots a game to get those 16 points. He's shooting an average of nine shots a night, making about six of them. Uh, so I just really like what I've seen from him, and he's really developed and uh, he's a unique player in that he's only like 6'8", I think, but he's playing center most of the time. And I've heard this comparison. Uh, I don't think it's fully accurate, but I think it has it makes some sense, but it, it's not fully accurate. So I heard uh, somebody comparing him to Dennis Rodman, like a modern NBA's Dennis Rodman. I think it's a little bit different because Harrell is definitely more of an offensive than defensive player. But I get what they're saying in that he's like the new wave of post player. He's sort of like 6'8", uh, but is really good. And I think this is a subject for a different time. But the NBA is really much more shifting towards just like every player being between 6'7 and 6'9, rather than like having strict uh, position sizes. But he's a definitely an example of this. But he's definitely been the biggest difference in shifting this trade in favor of uh, the Clippers in that he is 
originally a throw-in, but now has become a really solid starter and a guy that Houston could desperately use right now as a starting power forward uh, or a power forward or backup center off the bench. Uh, so this year, I'd say that the Clippers are definitely benefiting more from this trade than the Rockets. Uh, overall, what would I say? We got to keep waiting and seeing for what the future holds because, you know, if the Rockets do end up somehow making the playoffs and let's say getting to the second round and the Clippers also get to the second round, I'd say that the, uh, the Clippers have won it this year. But if after this year, the Clippers sort of come back down to earth and, uh, you know, Montrez Harrell continues to put up the same stats he is now, but like Lou Williams continues to, or starts to decline a bit because he's getting older and he is in his 30s, then we'll see uh, the the gradual decline that I'm expecting from CP3 will play a big factor in this as well. But as of right now, after uh, roughly one and a half years of this trade, I'd say it's about dead even. The Rockets got to a Game 7 of the Western Conference Finals from the trade, along with um, getting CP3 uh, to lead them to 65 wins. But really, I guess the main thing for the Rockets to me is, would they have been just as good off without CP3? Let's say they don't get him. Last year in the regular season, I would bet you they still win about 58 to 60 games. Um, they probably still get to the Western Conference Finals. They probably lose a lot sooner, probably like in five games instead of seven, or even getting swept. But then in this offseason this year, they would have had uh, essentially think of the forty million they committed to CP3 would have been could be committed to anybody else, and with that money they could have re-signed Trevor Ariza to ten million dollars, which is what he would have definitely taken. And uh, they could have signed Paul George to a deal for around $30 million, just for an example. Uh, so then you could have had a core of, let's say, a starting lineup. If they don't commit the trade, they would still have Pat Beverly. So their starting lineup would look something like Beverly at the one, uh, Harden at the two, Paul George at the three, probably P.J. Tucker still at the four, Capella at the five, and then off the bench you'd have Ariza and Eric Gordon as your main bench guys. I, I think that that team would still be just as effective. Remember, Lou Williams would have walked in free agency. Oh, you'd also have Montrez Harrell off the bench if this trade wouldn't have happened. So essentially, what do you guys think looks like a better roster right now? Uh, a current lineup of like um, Chris Paul, James Harden. Uh, I don't even know who's starting at small forward for them anymore. Uh, PJ Tucker's in the starting lineup. So is... Um, Clint Capella. I think small forward is uh, maybe Gerald Green. Once he comes back from injury, he'll be the starting small forward. They've been having to start Eric Gordon a lot more as well. Um, oh, James Ennis, of course. He's a starting small forward. So the starting uh, lineup for the Rockets currently is Paul, Harden, Ennis, Tucker, and Capella, with the main bench guys being... Um, the main bench guys are currently like Gary Clark and the new rookie Harkenstein. Is that roster better than a roster that would be Beverly, Harden, let's say Paul George, uh, PJ Tucker, Clint Capella with a bench of Eric Gordon, Ariza, and uh, Montrezl Harrell? It's hard to decide because Chris Paul is a, is a, a great NBA player and a star. But it's just something to consider. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope this makes you think a bit about whether trades are really worth it. Uh, even though they may help in the short run, they can change the balance of a team for years to come. And I think that's what uh, the Rockets and Clippers are both seeing right now. Hope you guys have a good day and I'll see you later. Bye.